Can we bow our heads to pray? Lord God, we pray that today you will give us grace to hear and receive the word that you bring. We pray that in taking to heart what it means, your Holy Spirit will lead and change us. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please sit down. For my birthday recently, that famous Lancashireman Eric Parker bought me a copy of Daft Yorkshire Fairy Tales. <laughs> this book contains such gems as Jack Spratt could eat no tripe, his wife could eat no parking, his favourite pyjamas had a narrow stripe, his sink it had a shark in. I can tell it's about your level, Eric. <laughs> but I, I sort of brought it along this morning because it's Christmas and um, <clears throat> it has a version of uh, I saw three ships come sailing by. And those of you who know the carol can sort of imagine this set to music. Now, of course, I'm only a Yorkshireman by adoption. And I can't do the accent, but you'll have to imagine that bit as well. All right, okay. I saw three ships come sailing by, come sailing by, come sailing by. I saw three ships come sailing by on Christmas Day in the morning. And that were odd, because I live in land. I live in land. I live in land. And that were odd, because I live in land in Barnsley in South Yorkshire. <laughs> My wife then said, that cheese were off. That cheese were off. That cheese were off. My wife then said, that cheese were off that you had yesterday morning. Hallucinating ships I was. Ships I was. Ships I was. Hallucinating ships I was. So let this be a warning. Never eat ancient Wensleydale. 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 Never eat ancient Wensleydale, or you'll see ships where there are none. <laughs> if you come to the carol service this evening, you can uh, join in the musical version. <laughs> Is that all right, Viv? <laughs> yeah, so, so Eric's been waiting for that all, all, all year, you know. Now, I tell that story because uh, I want to talk a bit about visions. Or oh, that's the starting point, anyway. Some hundred, many hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. When the nation of Israel were in exile in Babylon, a man named Daniel, who wrote the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, saw a number of visions. In one of the most important of these visions, he was visited by a man, an archangel, it turned out, called Gabriel. And in chapter 9 of Daniel, there's a description of how Gabriel tells Daniel what the future of his people will be. He predicts that they will return from Israel to live in their from Babylon rather to live in their own land. And he also predicts that many years will go by before the appearance of one who he calls the anointed one, or the Messiah, or in Greek, the Christ. After Daniel, there were very few other prophets. There was a prophet called Malachi who, 
whose book is the last in the Old Testament, and Joe was telling us a little about that a couple of weeks ago. But he predicted, and some people took this literally, that in 490 years there would be the appearance of a Messiah. Now many years went by, and after the prophet Malachi, there were hundreds of years of apparent silence from God. The fortunes of the Jewish people did not improve in those years. In fact, after years of domination by the Greeks, the Roman Empire took over the land. And so, it was a story of oppression. And the Jews, this proud people, who believed that their God had called them to freedom and to a unique covenant relationship with himself, found that they were ruled not by God, but by a foreign oppressor, by Gentiles who were outside the covenant and outside God's blessing. And the years went by. And it's quite hard for us to understand because we know what happened, what that must have been like. There was no sign of a word from the Lord There was no hope because there seemed no end to the Roman occupation. And for many of them, despair began to take over. And when the Gospels open with the stories of the birth of Jesus, we have to remember that here is a time when there is very little hope to be had. Yes, the Jews still took their scriptures seriously. They still believed that God would send an anointed one or a Messiah. But where was he? There was no sign that anything that Daniel had said or that any of the prophets had said was about to come true. Some of them thought, well, okay, many years have gone by and... We've counted off all the years in Daniel's prophecy. Could it be that something's about to happen? And of course, something was. And it involves, Luke tells us, the reappearance of Gabriel. And most of us know the story that Gabriel appears, first of all, not to uh, a great holy man or to a high priest, but to an ordinary priest called Zechariah, who's just going about his duties in the temple. The reappearance of Gabriel, interesting, especially when what he said all those years have gone by. But what about this Zechariah, who he comes to? Well, we are told that Zechariah was married to a woman called Elizabeth, but they were both very old. And of course, barrenness or childlessness in that culture was a sign of God's disapproval. One of them or one of their families must have done something so terribly wrong. And for years, most of their married life, they had lived with this stigma. They hadn't done anything wrong, but in the eyes of others, there must be something badly amiss there. And they had reached a point where there was no hope of anything changing. They were too old to have children. They had nothing to look forward to. The future held despair. And Luke's gospel, therefore, begins with the nation in a state of despair, with God apparently completely silent, with nothing to look forward to, and with a couple 
in the same place with nothing to look forward to. And it's into that situation and that context that God starts to act and where God starts to speak. And after this first appearance of of Gabriel, it's not very long before Elizabeth, who is so far on in years, finds that she's expecting a child. Doesn't tell you, does he, anything about morning sickness. (laughs) But then also, this Gabriel, who's not been seen in the affairs of human beings for hundreds of years, appears again. This time to a woman who's very young, who's engaged but not married, who couldn't expect to have children at the stage she was at. And Gabriel appears again. And this time, the promises are even greater. You have been chosen to be the mother of the anointed one. The one that Daniel had predicted. Because the time is fulfilled. The promises are kept. God, who has not spoken for so long, is not silent. He is coming to save us. And of course, it's not the kind of king that they had started to learn to expect. They thought, surely this has got to be about the throwing off of Roman oppression and of God being exalted as king from the temple in Jerusalem again. This must be the royal house of David. Well, it was, but it was tucked away in Nazareth in the carpenter's shop. This is not the king we thought about. But God is keeping his promises. This is Gabriel. He's back. And so, all of a sudden, out of a situation of complete despair and a family who have got nothing to look forward to is the promise both of the Elijah forerunner who's going to come before the Messiah, John the Baptist, and of the anointed one himself is coming to save us. God is about to burst in. You see, we've been thinking over the past weeks as we've looked at these Christmas stories again about the very important fact that Luke, when he wrote, did not set out to write a few Christmas stories. This stuff is not just for Christmas. This is gospel. This is good news. It means something. It speaks good news into the hearts of every one of us and everyone who has ever lived. And that's how we need to see these stories. Great news. And as Mary and Elizabeth, who are distantly related to each other, come and, uh, and suddenly come into each other's presence, their eyes meet, and the joy of knowing what's going on means that there's a connection there which is electric. And, uh, uh, and Elizabeth just feels this child in her womb jumping for joy. And... Mary, when she encounters that, just bursts into song. A song which has been sung ever since, you know, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices. I'll tell you something, I've been in some churches where the Magnificat has been sung like a dirge. I won't demonstrate. But 
you know, it wasn't like that, was it? You know, these two women, they knew what God, who hadn't been apparently around for so long, was about to go on the move, and it must have been jumping up and down. It's fantastic. You know, and if we'd sing the Magnificat a bit more like that these days, the world might start to believe that what the church has is true. Now, this is fantastic news. This is, the, this is God is, is not just doing wonderful things for us. He's about to do something which is, really, which is going to have ripples that are going to go through the centuries and all around the world. And at this time of year, as we begin to approach Christmas, we need to hear this message. Because the situation to which this gospel is addressed is a situation which, sadly, we still find in so many places. You can imagine that a fair bit of my work is done encountering people in despair. It's not easy. And a lot of it's about listening. A lot of it's about trying to share how I've had to try and confront some of the same sort of emotions in my own life. But we know that all this stuff's a reality. It's part of our experience sometimes. And the, the kind of childlessness which has led to it is still sadly a reality for many families. But despair of you know, the worst kind that's part of our culture, the fact that so many people encounter the depths of depression and that somehow even religious faith doesn't seem to help sometimes. And so many of us know, not, if not for ourselves, within our families or amongst our friends or the people in our street, that the reality, uh, sorry, the, the, the reality uh, of despair, of uncertainty, of not knowing, of, of, of not encountering any meaning. <coughs> and it's easy for us to feel that kind of thing when we just look at the world around us and the things that are happening. And this story, therefore, addresses all of those situations. That God is not a silent God, even if we think he is. He hasn't done anything for us for quite a long time. Well, there are people who felt like that in the time of Jesus. And that God's answer to these things is, on one level, simple. On another level, very hard to receive. That God has come. He has acted. He has come in history in the person of Jesus, the child of Bethlehem. And that the message, as the message of Advent emphasizes, that he will come again to draw an end to this age and all the things which push us down the road to despair. The message of Christmas is very profoundly good news. A message which should lead us to jump for joy as Mary and Elizabeth jumped for joy on the day when they met one another. <coughs> this Christmas time, let's allow the joy of knowing that to dispel the despair that's all around us. And let's pray that as people see that coming out of us, 
they can know something of that joy as well.